Hello, this is Ryan with Deepwood Handcraft. Coming to you again with another quick video from a rainy day here in Wasilla, Alaska. Um, starting to look a bit less like summer and a bit more like fall around here because this is what fall looks like. It just rains every day pretty much. Um, and then it gets extremely cold and turns to snow and you got winter. And uh, I don't really mind either of those events. I, I rather enjoy the fall season and also I really enjoy the winter season. Um, something about extreme cold and snow suits me well and that's probably because I'm a hairy beast and uh, that must mean that it's in my blood maybe but anyway so we've got some uh, some new stuff to show today and this is the direction you're gonna see us heading in on some of our designs and uh, we've got a specific provider in mind that we're going to bring all this in the long run through. We're going to bring it through them. But I'm not going to get into all that right now. You're just going to have to wait and see. Um, but anyway, this is, is kind of a, an, an infant idea that we're going to build on. And uh, between me and my buddy Cameron, we've been talking about this kind of stuff for a long time. At least, you know, quite a few months now, just pitching ideas. And uh, he's had some really good ones, so we're going to start working on those things. This is just kind of an uh, infant version of those ideas that you will see uh, built upon as we go. So what we have here today... Is this is an extremely modded haversack. And we started with the basic um, Pathfinder haversack design. Wanted a different style lid, didn't want the stitching or the uh, lacing, so we did the uh, veg tan trim sewn on instead and a squared off lid as opposed to the beaver tail. Uh, still got the axe loop on the back. The strapping on this one is a little bit thicker because of the added weight that this thing is going to carry. And I don't mean thicker, I mean wider. It's a little bit wider. Um, the standard Pathfinder haversack comes with the inch and a quarter strapping. This is inch and a half. And uh, same with the slack keepers on the back, the, or the uh, D-ring keepers on the back. They match the strapping for width on both of those bags. So the strap is a little bit long. It's got a little bit extra slack because uh, that's the customer's request so we can accommodate those kind of things so as you can see it's got the axe loop on the back and that's a uh, Letterling's 19 inch hunting axe just for um, size reference and that can ride either direction that you would prefer it to ride and like I said before that doesn't really get in the way as you're traveling you know, you're not going to be carrying the back here you're going to probably be most likely carrying it here and as you're walking and going through that axe loop does not hit my legs at all I don't even know it's there so that's not a problem so with this haversack we've got something going on here on the front panel under the lid along with the uh, customary fabric stuffed in just to give it some shape and kind of simulate having it stuffed full of gear. So under the lid we have a few things here. First of all is a Hudson Bay tobacco tin pocket with its own snap lid and I had to add this lid after the fact because uh, the pocket was supposed to go inside, but I didn't really love that idea because of the, uh, first of all, wherever you put it, that kind of takes up that room inside the, the bag, and that's not necessarily a problem except that now you've got stitching on the outside of the bag that just kind of looks random, and uh, pulling gear in and out of the bag with this fixed in place kind of presents somewhat of an obstacle I would think and if you've got a bulky piece of gear that um, 
has to sit in there a certain way this might be in the way depending on how you're packing and instead of going through all that of uh, having to have a specific way to pack the bag based on this being on the inside I just went ahead and put it on the outside and I was thinking that just the friction of this would be uh, enough to hold it in there because that's usually what happens when it's got a veg tan backing but because of the soft leather nature of the bag it didn't quite go that way so I went ahead and wet formed and threw this lid on top of it and gave it a snap to keep it low profile so it didn't like a uh, antler toggle didn't get in the way of the bag or whatever so we've got that this pocket is veg tan brass snaps and I've antiqued those a bit just kind of match the rest of the uh, hardware on the bag between the D-rings and all the hardware all this brass has been antiqued which I personally love the look of this is just my style as far as my preferences go we can do this kind of hardware in nickel or uh, shiny brass or whatever you want to do it comes as just regular brass and I antique it myself with the D-rings um, the buckles the antique brass buckles come antiqued um, but we can also get these same style of buckles without the antiquing on them so that is also not a problem and uh, here's this buckle again I've shown it in one of my other videos it's got the slack keeper built on it I really love these things they're just really cool in my opinion so also with this he wanted a uh, sheath for his backhoe laplander that could be carried on the bag or on the belt and so what we've done here there's nothing really fancy about this it's just a wet formed um, veg tan sheath and what I've done here is add I've done the belt loop a little bit differently and added this D-ring on so either this thing can hang from whatever you want to hang it from I've provided a spot here on the bag for it to hang from but you could also hang any number of things off of this instead you could also just put a loop of leather around this some leather lace and hang it from the uh, shoulder strap D-ring that would work fairly well also and be extremely simple to do and then you could have this kind of idea to hang smaller bits of gear like ferro rod or you know if you've got a little I mean any number of things you can think of what to hang off the bag but this also can ride right here and it does hang a little bit below the bag but also it's kind of the same thing with this axe loop in the back that handle hangs a little bit lower also so um, I don't see that being a major problem unless you're walking on your knees or you're extremely short and it's dragging the ground but then you could just adjust the shoulder strap to carry a little higher on your person and that would not be an issue so on this side we've got two more of these and as you can see these are easy to deal with these are not uh, they're not a hassle they kind of spin free so you don't have to I've provided enough room in there so that they kind of hang freely so you can get your hand around it throw your thumb on it easy to work with easy to deal with highly functional and uh, very useful in my opinion kinda like the way this idea has turned out and I'm gonna start doing more with this kind of thing um, not necessarily attached to a bag even I got some ideas for this also so along with the lines of the Backo sheath. He wanted a axe mask for his. Um, this is a Gransfer's Brooks mini belt hatchet. I, I think it's called. Anyway, this is I would think the smallest belt hatchet that they make. And so, same thing. He wanted something that he could carry on his belt. It's the belt loops, and also on the bag. And you could do the same thing with some lace or some paracord if you wanted to tie this thing up and have it rod here off of this D-ring. That would not be a problem. And then that would free these up. You hang all kind of gear off those. Um, so this has also got the brass snaps thing going. And it's also wet formed around the 
axe head. And when this is closed, there's no way this is coming out of there. There is a little bit of play, but it's less play than the head that comes with it from the factory on the Wetterlings and the Gransfors Brooks axes. So there's a little bit of room for that to move in there, but not enough to make a difference of any sort. Um, and that's just kind of the way it happens sometimes. But the lid closes flat over top of that, and that's because I've wet formed it to do that. Um, and you can see the uh, lid is sewn onto the back. Uh, the next one I do of this kind of style will probably just be one continuous piece, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it while I was doing it. And uh, I'm not the leather worker that makes a bunch of templates out of cardboard before I jump into the leather. I just jump right into the leather and uh, go with that. And it's not to say I never make design mistakes or mistakes in general, but when I do, I scrap that stuff out and start over again. And I think that's because you get a better fit that way. I don't like doing it out of cardboard first because for one thing that means doing it twice. Regardless of what you're doing, you got to do it twice as far as the design and the marking and the cutting and all that stuff goes. And for another reason, the leather is a lot thicker than the cardboard and it doesn't necessarily act the same as far as room inside goes. So I prefer to just jump right in. I don't necessarily recommend everybody do that, but if you want to, don't be afraid. That's how the best stuff happens in my opinion, at least for me, that's how it works for me, so that's what I do. So I've attached these belt loops on there separately, and I've dropped this one down in the back because of the lid being sewn on there. And this could all be done much differently if you don't want the D-rings on there. Um, I could just do one standard fold over belt loop, and what would happen there if you wanted this to ride higher on the belt, not have so much of this room up here it would just be sewn across wherever here and then the fold over it would be sewn to itself down here so you'd have a little bit of extra material kind of hanging down a little bit all the way across and then uh, that way you could adjust how high it rides on your belt if you don't want it to be dropped down like this one is but this is kind of how this happened while I was designing it to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish with the D-rings and uh, so this is how it turned out. So in other words, this doesn't have to be done this way necessarily. This is the way it was done because I was figuring it out as I went kind of thing. But I think it turned out fantastic. I'm extremely happy with this. Um, it's a little busy on the back, but it all looks good in my opinion. Everything's straight and kind of measured off each other so that the lines are straight and nothing is looking crooked or sideways or half tilted or so anyway, if you will notice, this would appear, if it was a knife, to be a left-handed sheath. Because if I'm wearing it on my right side, the blade is going to be facing behind me instead of... I mean, I guess that's how it is with a knife, but you know what I'm saying. If I pull this out, it's going to be backwards. And the reason I did it that way is if you want to wear it on your right side, and you also want to wear your knife on your right side, the blade will not get in the way of the knife and will ride back here where there's likely to not be as much stuff or issue. If I put it on this way, of course, you could carry it with your knife here and the thing in front of the knife, but then you've got this blade kind of into your leg a little bit, and I don't love that idea in the slightest. So if you want to wear it on your left side, that's not a problem. There it is. If you want to wear it on your right side with your knife, you can just put it right behind there, and then uh, it stays out of the way, and it doesn't dig into you while you're walking or get into your thigh or you know if you get attacked by Sasquatch out there or something and you rip your sheath open while it's on your leg then you're not going to cut yourself open and bleed out though you would still have to deal with Sasquatch at that point so hopefully the axe would be in your hand but anyway so that is that also hangs off the bag um, this is kind of the same concept for what I would do with the tomahawk sheath. And if you notice, the handle is a little fatter down here than it is up at the top. That's not a problem getting that in and out of there. The leather gives um, well in order to get that in. But you kind of do have to face it a certain direction necessarily. Put the fat in in first. 
it's much easier to do if it's on your belt actually or somewhere static that you're not having to hold the weight of it up. And as that gets used, it'll kind of develop its own little groove there for pulling in and out, if that makes any sense. Because all this is fresh and new, and fresh and new means a, a bit stiff because it hasn't been used or worn in yet because it is leather and it is wet formed. So that is that. Now what I was saying with the tomahawk sheath, these heads are built so that, uh, or these sheaths are built so that you could carry this thing. If this was a tomahawk, you could bust your handle out and pull your handle out and just carry the head if you wanted to and carry your handle separately or not at all. Um, I've had people that wanted the sheath and the first one of these was a uh, cold steel trailhawk and he didn't necessarily always want to have a handle on him riding his motorcycle and all that and traveling in foreign countries it looks a lot less knifeish and weaponish if it doesn't have a handle in it looks more like an ulu at that point um, and I don't particularly love the idea of having you know you see often the belt loop that rides on your belt and the knife slides into and then the mask is separate and that's a great idea I don't have any problems with that idea except that for me I have a problem where I take my axe mask off and put it down and then I gotta spend the next 10 minutes when I'm ready to put it back on looking for it if I haven't hooked it around my belt and snapped it to itself which I, I usually do with my wetterlings but if for some reason I've just chucked it off and dropped it you know it's brown and uh, the ground is brown and it camouflages itself fairly quickly so I prefer to have a static kind of all-in-one package where the part holding the thing on your belt is the same piece as the part holding the uh, blade in there so I do these all-in-one kind of things um, if you don't like this all-in-one idea Justin Wolf from Wolf Customs does a pretty awesome uh, two-piece deal with has the belt loop that goes on your belt and the mask that goes on your and that's all just a matter of personal preference for me I don't love that because I tend to lose my and I've never lost it but I don't like looking for things uh, especially not on the ground when they're hard to see especially if it's dawn or dusk or sometime where it's dark outside that's a real pain to me so I prefer this all-in-one and that's kind of how that comes about So as you can see, there's nothing to hold the lid closed, but uh, it tends to hang that way anyway, which is a fairly traditional idea for haversacks, and it's long enough that uh, it's kind of going to cover and protect this stuff a little bit. I wasn't intended necessarily to hang these this low off the front of the bag, but that's kind of just the way it had to happen. So I don't really think it's going to be a problem. Um, this stuff is all treated for waterproofness and I mean I, I guess really it's I wouldn't consider it waterproof but it's extremely water resistant unless you're gonna drop it in to some warm water and let it sit there for a little bit at which point it would probably soak some up but uh, I don't use the uh, finishers and stuff that they sell at Tandy I prefer to finish with my own stuff and I use Overnoff and occasionally beeswax to accomplish that goal um, same thing I don't use like edge coat or anything like that because eventually that stuff will crack and peel off and you might say well eventually this is gonna get scarred up and scratched up anyway and at which point you could just take a little bit of fine sandpaper and smooth that out throw some uh, dye or sharpie marker or whatever over the top of that and put a little bit of treatment on it and then buff it up again and it's good as new that edge coat stuff once it starts cracking and kind of going off there, it's it's kind of, I mean, I could be wrong about it, but it just is extremely much easier to fix something without some synthetic or weird tarry stuff on it 
and it's the same with the uh, finisher stuff. I use that Obernoth and buff both the inside of the sheath and the outside of the sheath so this is treated before it ever gets put together. So the inside of your sheath is not going to hold moisture in the way that the leather is going to absorb water and then keep it there. Um, it's been heavily treated with the Obernoff so that the water is going to repel. And sure, that's closed off and there's no weep hole in there, but I mean, it's not a difficult thing to dry that out or whatever. It's not like the water's just all going to run and pour right off of there anyway, even though it does beat up. Um, so I don't use acrylic finishes on this kind of stuff. And that's because once that stuff starts cracking and going nasty, it's kind of over with, in my opinion, or at least the start of the end. Whereas, if something happens to this, it can be fixed with minimum effort and brought to look, brought back to life again without having to use some store-bought, factory-manufactured, weird chemical, plastic, petroleum nonsense. But that's just my personal preference and opinions. I don't... I could be wrong about all of that, but that's been my experience with knife sheaths that I've got from custom makers and um, stuff I've seen made by the managers at Tandy. I'm not in love with the uh, synthetic products. I... And sorry for the cut scenes, but my camera keeps telling me the memory is full, and so I have to go back there and delete scenes that I haven't taken off it because I'm not a camera person or a computer person, even though I have studied for computer stuff. I hate it. Anyway, as I was saying, treat it inside and out, natural stuff. It's not going to hold water. It's not going to soak water in unless you put it in some uh, fairly warm, open the pores type heated water and then let it sit in there for a while. The rain's just going to beat up on this stuff and go right off. And if you get scratches in this deep enough to take it down into the flesh where the dye hasn't gone and you get light colored scratches, an extremely easy remedy for that is going to just take a, a black sharpie marker with a fine tip go over that scratch to where it's nice and covered and then thumb over it so it kind of blends it in with the rest of the uh, color and sure the line will be darker than the brown on the flesh or the top grain but that adds character in my opinion and if you were to take this same color dye and do that as you can see that dye is darker than this anyway so uh, that's going to look the same regardless of how you do it. But a Sharpie marker just to get something kind of cover in that scratch and then uh, put a little bit of your Obernoff or whatever you're using to treat your leather with over top of that. And uh, just adds character to this kind of old-fashioned looking stuff anyway. So that's one way that you can fix scratches. Um, and that's a way that I would recommend. It works for me. Um, to the point where you can't really tell the scratches there and if you can like there's some try to find some stuff on the grain of these things where the grain naturally has either scratches in it or scarring or you know the cows got into some brambles or something and uh, I don't think that detracts from the look of this stuff at all I think it actually adds adds a bit of character to it anyway it's all over the leather all the time but uh, when it does arise it looks good in my opinion and if there's a scratch in it and you cover it over with a sharpie it's just gonna add character to the whole thing doesn't even have to be brown I just would recommend black if it's dark like this um, if not you can get you know shoe polish or any number of things the goal though is not to get it all over the surface but just on where the scratch is so that that flesh on the inside is not exposed and then cover it over with a bit of beeswax or whatever beeswax based leather treatment or if you're into the synthetic stuff like snow seal or whatever Aussie treatment just something to cover that back up and give it its water resistance back again um, and I'll do a whole separate video on leather care in the near future so I'll cover all that stuff again if you happen to not have watched this video this far while I'm rambling on about random things in the leather world. So, uh, just one more look at this thing.
and all there is to it. So something like this with all these modifications on it, you know, the very basic standard, uh, sorry about the hand, the very basic standard haversacks from uh, the Pathfinder store are 150 and of course they don't carry those in stock. You uh, click on that link um, at pathfinderstore.com and it takes you to our website and then you're going to have to order that to drop ship from us. Um, and that's just because of the time it takes to make these things. There's no way I can just mass produce them because I'm doing all this by hand and it's just me and my wife at the moment. Hopefully we will grow and expand and some of that expansion might include people in far corners of the United States. Uh, some of those people I've already talked to a little bit about such a thing. But that would probably include us getting some templates made up so that all this stuff comes out uniform and uh, custom stuff from us would be handled directly from us but uh, that's all in the future if we ever are able to get into that we will but for now it's just me and my wife and this stuff takes a lot of time to do by hand especially with custom work and new designs and stuff like that it takes a little bit of time to work that out um, so we're doing the best we can and we're also thinking about a little bit of restructuring and that kind of thing too to kind of accommodate those things so we'll see how all that goes but uh, something like this, the standard one is 150 and that's just bare bones haversack with a beaver tail lid with leather lacing around it. And that price might go up in the future depending on material costs going up. And, uh, but we're going to try, try our very best not to have that go up because we want this stuff to be affordable. But at the same time, it just takes so long and the materials are so expensive to make it and especially doing it all by hand. I'm not going to get a machine and start sewing this stuff on a machine. That's just not what I'm doing here. Um, there are plenty of people doing that. So if you can't afford our gear, then there are other people and other avenues out there that are selling that stuff for a lot cheaper, but it's going to be different materials and it's going to be sewn on a machine. One of those places is Etsy. You can get some decent looking. I've never had anything from any of those stores. But if you search leather backpack or leather bag on Etsy, you're going to find a whole bunch of stuff on there that's really affordable, but it's coming from places like uh, India and Taiwan, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's something you're not going to be able to know what the materials are necessarily before you get it. And I personally have a, a very close, personal, severe hatred for upholstery leather in the use of outdoors gear. It's just not what it's made for. It's made for sitting on or wearing in a non-friction setting and by that I mean you're not going to be walking through tree branches or um, you're going to want to get into oil oil tanned utility leathers or some some kind of porous leather that's going to be able to take treatment for waterproofness and that upholstery leather has a bunch of synthetic garbage all over the top of it that will eventually wear away and crack and then you're exposing the flesh side underneath and it's extremely thin to begin with so um, we don't use upholstery leather on anything ever and uh, if you've got some upholstery leather gear in your kit I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing especially if it's going to stay inside your bag and not be something that's carried outside in the weather or anyway not trying to get into all that discussion right now but Etsy does have some avenues if you're wanting some leather gear um, it's not handmade and I can't tell you what materials it's made out of but maybe they can if you contact them but anyway we're doing this by hand it takes a long time and it's expensive and that's just the way it's got to be I don't make a bunch of I'm not getting rich off this in any way um, I can say very honestly I'm not even comfortable as far as finances go doing this like this it's much more of a lifestyle choice and deal with the consequences kind of thing rather than a hey I can make bush gear and get rich off of it that's not what's happening here in any way. Um, so if you think my gear is unaffordable and you think that that's because I'm gouging and trying to get rich off of it, that's not the case at all. Um, my eventual goals in life are to buy some land and do the homesteading bit where I don't have to have as much money to buy food from the store or drive into town constantly or do that kind of thing but right now I don't have the money to, to acquire the land to even start that whole process which it is a major process we've done a little bit of it in the past but uh, 
So I got to survive on what I make doing this because this is my job and this is what we're doing and it allows us to do other things with the way that we raise our family and do that kind of thing. But at the same time, I'm not going to get rich doing this. It's just not going to happen and I'm not doing it to get rich so that's not as much of a problem for me. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll have another video on that too as far as how I got into this and, and what getting into this really does entail as far as making an income. It's not something that happens overnight. Um, for very much positive reasons but uh, I'll get into all that later so that's it for me for the moment I'll be coming out with another couple of videos here shortly one thing we got coming up finishing in the next couple of days is a uh, leather carrier case with a shoulder strap for the new canteen shop and Pathfinder school um, stainless canteen cook set and we'll be able to do those for just the canteen or the whole cook set or however you want to work that out. But this this first one that we're doing is for the uh, whole cook set together. It's going to have a shoulder strap and maybe a pocket on the outside. And we'll see how all that goes. Uh, it's in the process right now, but it's not finished up yet. And you never really know until it's done how well it's going to work. So keep your eye out for that. And uh, quite a few more videos we're going to try to come out with as time permits. Um, so that's it for me. Have a good day.